Do you think Katie Holmes gets really frustrated when she's on her phone and she's like, hey, Suri, and her phone's like, bing. It's yes. like, do you need me? <laughs> it's like, no, Suri, I'm not the dishwasher. <laughs> do you think Suri's ever had to unload the dishwasher? No, I don't think she even, I think the dishwasher it's to Suri is like a person. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't think they have so a machine So she'd be like, why dishwasher? do I have to unload? <laughs> Jaime. Jaime. <laughs> Here comes the theme. Hello and welcome to The Critical Breakdown, the podcast where we start at the bottom of Rotten Tomatoes and work our way to 100% fresh. I'm Max. And I'm Scott. Today we're talking close encounters of the third kind. Mm -hmm. Rated 96% Rotten Tomatoes and chosen by our noble listeners, (laughs) as we have been known to call them. All, All the time. This is a sequel to... Far Encounters of the Second mm, Kind. Mm, I thought you were just going to go with Close Encounters of the Second Kind. No. Yeah. And then it's, it's a, there's actually the third in a trilogy. The first being Distant Encounters of the mm, First mm, Kind. Yeah, yeah. The second, of course, being Far Encounters of the Second Kind. And the third, of course, being and uh, Close Encounters yeah, of the Third and, Kind. Yeah, and they're working on a sequel now, yeah. which is... Uh, Way too close for comfort encounters of the fourth kind. Yeah. Not to be confused with the movie Fourth Kind. The Fourth Kind. The Fourth yeah. Kind, which yeah. just was the bad. Yeah. So. The bad. Yeah. So uh, for any new listeners welcome. just now tuning in, welcome. Yeah. Uh, well, you okay. finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, we started out at the bottom. We started with 0% Boom. and we've worked our way all the way up to the 90s. And in here, uh, I get a choice. Scott gets choice, and our listeners get a choice. Or as we've been known to call them. Our noble listeners. Our noble listeners. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And also along the way, we listened to, or we watched <laughs> and listened to a number of movies in between Zero and the 90s. Yeah, yeah. And a number of those movies were also space invasions. <laughs> it's true, like spacey, invader, yeah. contacty type of films. This is kind of like, yeah, this is the... Uh, would this be the granddaddy of them all in that sense? Oh no, I guess the I... day the Earth stood still would be. That's like the most famous. Old oh, one. like the the OG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds. But Those that wasn't two. like a film, right? But it began as a play. Yeah. But they did make a film. Of that it. was definitely like it inspired a lot of this. Yeah, sure. yeah. So a lot of the tone was set from that. This took it. Well, I know with the day the Earth stood still, it's the aliens showing up saying that there's going to be like nuclear annihilation from humans. I think I haven't oh. seen it since I was a kid, but. No. Uh, it's like them giving a warning, like, yeah. hey, don't don't mess up. And then you can kind of see those threads of both of those throughout the rest of yeah. all the alien movies. And um, Yeah, we, we have talked on the podcast, we've talked Contact, mm-hmm. we've talked Signs, and we've talked Arrival, which mm-hmm. would be like the big three that are similar to this. But you could even start to go like Battlefield Earth in Mac a way. And me. But that's like a way future. Mac and me, yeah. We mentioned E. T. quite a bit. We haven't discussed it. E. T. was thing. a nominee, I um, believe, for one. Yeah, of but we've. You know. I know I watched it during during our uh, viewing. I think you watched it yeah, for uh, of Mac and me. Yeah, I yeah. Did. So we've both brought it up at key times. Yeah. But there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot. Of, Independence Day comes up quite a bit. Uh, mm-hmm. Usually because you're not a fan, <laughs> but I am. Yeah. Um, but you can you can track all these back to these sources. And what's interesting with this one is it's uh, it kind of sticks out a little bit because it's more towards the benevolent side. Um, the aliens aren't doing anything. Yeah, there's not like it's not like the aliens are well. In Arrival, the aliens are very yeah. So they're benevolent. on the benevolent side, and on and contact, contact, you can yeah. argue that too. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So I wonder if those they're directly kind of neutral here. I felt full, like. yeah, and oh. I, I wonder if those threads come from this. Basically, is what yeah. I'm getting at. Um, because I mean Spielberg went on to do his War of the Worlds, uh, yeah. which definitely wasn't the benevolent aliens, but obviously he does have some affinity for it. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I got a hot take. And and we'll and we'll hold everything else on this movie until the discussion. This is my least favorite of the of the four fresh alien invasion movies we've watched. That's fair. That's oh. fair. I'm just saying, a little hot take. Play What's that fair? sizzle sound drop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I now have a sizzle sound drop. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, speaking of sizzling, any hot off the press releases you've been watching? Uh, as far as hot off the presses, no. Okay. But <laughs> I've been watching stuff. Um, yeah, what have you been watching? First up, I've jumped back into a show that I enjoy watching from time to time, but I uh, I haven't watched it in a, in a couple months, which is uh, Orphan Black. Oh, yeah. I saw you watching it when I was over, 
were here the other day for something you were yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe so, they'll watch Close Encounters. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it, exactly We've was. been known to um, do that. So. so it's really good still. Uh, I'm on season two, I want to say. The the first season wasn't that long. I think it was maybe 13 episodes or something. Um, and season two, I don't think, is that much longer, if it is. Yeah. Uh, but once again, the show is amazing because uh, the actress Tatiana, I think it's Masali or Malazi? Maisley. Maisley. Maisley yeah, like that, um, yeah. She won... Um, an Emmy for this. And that makes perfect sense because where I'm watching now, she plays at least, I would say, five different characters, all with different personalities who I constantly forget are the same actress. Um, so much that it's not just like the accents are different. It's definitely the whole persona, the visual aesthetic, yeah. like all of it is different enough where I keep forgetting that this is camera magic to make them on screen together and that it's just really good writing and acting. Now, I don't know the full... you Because you, you've talked about it before in the podcast when you'd watched it prior. Mm -hmm. Is she playing clones of herself? Yes. Or does that not fully reveal... They reveal it pretty pretty okay. soon on. Because the show opens with an interesting uh, premise, which is she sees a... The, the main one we follow, named Sarah, sees herself yeah. commit suicide. And That's right. I did yeah. watch the first episode, so now yeah. I'm remembering that. And so yeah. from there, it's like she kind of uncovers this whole world that the clone that committed suicide was involved in and there's all sorts of intrigue and they were introducing new elements now that are even weirder um so kind of the first season's kind of like a crime drama in some sense where they're just trying to figure out what's going on with this one clone right. that's killing everyone and then season two takes it like a completely different direction it kind of dives um, more into the sci-fi yeah of yeah it. so it's it's still really cool i'm just taking my time enjoying it um i've been really hankering to watch the show fringe but it's not streaming anywhere i have is it on? I thought it might have been on Hulu. You can purchase it on certain yeah. things, but well, I cannot Amazon, find it on sure. Hulu. Yeah, so it's streaming if you buy it, but yeah. it's uh, not free streaming anymore yeah. uh, or not that, covered by your services. That's one that I've been wanting to watch yeah. as well. I think I watched the first um, two seasons and I loved it. And you've recommended um, it to me yeah. a number of times. Yeah. So. If you like the JJ, like start the a J show, give J. you J. a mystery, Abrams, yeah. like it has its flaws in the early stuff because it's very monster of a week but, yeah uh, that's what i heard and then yeah. it becomes more of like a really going into the yeah, sci-fi it, it builds into yeah. all the monster of the week episodes build into the finale for each season that i saw so it, it's while it's tiresome sometimes to see that kind of format yeah. it has definitely direction to it and so there is like an overarching up. arc so the, yeah but in the later seasons it's like legitimately very good right yeah yeah oh for sure and so I've been watching, you know, I've been having this like sci-fi urge. So Orphan Black feels that pretty good. Yeah. But I really do want to get back and watch Fringe again. Um, just real quick on that. I remember one episode was set, I think, in the 80s. And just for no reason. all oh, Fringe? Don't, yeah. They don't tell you that. And the episode begins with an 80s intro for the show, like how it normally is. So you just are thrown into this alternate yeah. episode. It's amazing. But uh, that was just, I think that was in season two. Um, so until I find where that's... Uh, or just have to just pony up some money, I guess. But, yeah. Well, uh, if you do, let me know. Yeah. Maybe I'll maybe well, I'll be a co-benefactor because I'd yeah, like to watch. That's true. You could be. Uh, that that kind of reminds me of in Lost, the season two premiere, has like just like the first five minutes are from another character that you've never met's perspective, mm -hmm. and it looks like it's in like the '60s. Oh, that's cool. And in, like he plays like an old record, like Jefferson Starship or something. And, yeah. Um. So it's kind of like that, and that's then cool. it turns yeah. out that he is in the hatch. It's is that with uh? Make your own kind of music playing. Yeah, yeah, I remember that because that yeah. song got big at the time. Everyone well, I knew yeah. was like I mean, listening that was, to it, then. and that was still when Lost was like the peak TV. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a good song. Um, yeah, I was, I listen to it. It's, so. It gets stuck in my head occasionally. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, I've been watching a little sci-fi. Oh yeah, what you watching? Maniac. Oh, what I've been Netflix? meaning to watch that. The other yeah. day, uh, my wife said to me, "Do you want to want to do you want to watch that 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 one Netflix show?" Yeah, and I said, "Yeah, you got to tell me what it is." I'm pretty sure she meant this one. And then she put on Fuller House. <laughs> yeah. She never said. She just changed the subject afterwards, which isn't a surprise to anyone no. who knows her. But that means you're a little closer, though. Yeah, yeah. I'm four, maybe five episodes in, and it's starting to get into what I thought the entire show would be. I thought the whole show was whatever sci-fi stuff happens, and then they live out these like alternate universes. I mm -hmm. thought that was like the whole show, where there are couples somehow, and I don't know how they get there, but uh, it's starting to get to that now. But the whole world is really interesting. That's cool. Uh, and there's a lot of mystery built into it. And yeah. it's just really well made. So I like it so far. But I'm not far enough in to have like any answers on anything yet. It's yeah. still full mystery. I like I like the look of it from yeah. all the ads and stuff. I like that it has... Uh, I've made jokes before, but I do like that it gives me some 
similarities to like Legion oh. um, and that also uh, Eternal Sunshine, like both of those, which yeah. I love. Um, I'm not saying it's at all like it. I'm just yeah, saying. Uh, I only watched four episodes of Legion, but um, th- they're not very similar. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But in the look, I get what you're saying. And I guess uh, I'm meaning, yeah, the look and more like formalistic yeah. stuff, not story stuff, because I yeah. haven't seen Maniac, so I can't claim for yeah. that. But uh, so far, it's at least pretty linear. Yeah. To my knowledge. Maybe they're doing some weird stuff with time, but. That's cool. Uh, for the most part, it's been linear, but they've been just really diving into Emma Stone and Jonah Hill's characters. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it is very interesting. So I'm going to stick with it, but it's a little heavy and I, I could, I can't, I don't do like a binge of like five yeah. episodes in a row. Yeah. Like I, I've been rewatching American Vandal season one, which I had mentioned last mm-hmm. week because I just finished season two and then I just auto played season one and it's still very funny, but that those episodes are so easy to consume because it's very lighthearted satire. So I've been just like flying through that and like hat like 75% paying attention. We've been watching a different Netflix show. It's actually not Netflix, I think. I think it's CNN, technically. Wow. The oh, docuseries, the 90s. The 90s. Yeah. yeah, it keeps getting recommended to me. Yeah, it's good, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I liked their docuseries, the 80s. Yeah. Um, Do they also do The Toys That Made Us? Is that the same thing? I don't know if that's a CNN one. Okay. It might be, but it might just be like a different yeah. docuseries. Um, Is it anything like I Love the 80s and I Love the 90s? On you VH1? will know some of the content from no. it. So, like, on this one, it's set up kind of by subject each episode. Yeah. So, it's a two-parter for the first episode, which is about TV of the 90s, okay. which is a huge subject. So, that's sure. why they have to do a, a twofer. Um, but in there, they talk about stuff like Cop Rock, which I remember they talked about in I Love the 90s, um, which was the uh, police procedural that was yeah. turned into a musical. So, huh. it was like a musical police procedural. I like that. It, it was a critical failure, for sure, uh, and got canceled. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But it Wait, does. So it wasn't like a one-time event. Cop no, it, it was like, was like they were show. trying to make a show. Yeah, okay. as a one-time like event, it, it might have worked. Um, yeah, like now they do on NBC. Like the, they yeah. do like hairspray. Jesus yeah, yeah. Christ, super, like some of those get hated on, but they they keep Bring making them. You know, yeah, dude. someone watches them. Let's pitch it. Put Michael Buble in on it, and people are gonna watch God. it. Officer Buble. Um, <laughs> but no, it's a it's good. Save it's it it's, it's interesting to see a docu series from something you've experienced. Like, yeah the entire time yeah so you're reminded of a lot of stuff like with the 80s one i only experienced the bottom half of the 80s and, and i really barely experienced baby it. max um, yeah so some of it was just how the culture was when i was yeah. you know three to four and coming into yeah. awareness um your formative years yeah so with this one it's very much like i remember pretty much every step of the way yeah. like they go through the real world i remember watching the real world mm. all the time What's like your all favorite the season stuff, in the real so. world boston mine down. was new orleans new orleans was good it was okay it wasn't that good Boston was really good. I remember this one scene I always sticks out in my head where the three guys, I think, are driving down the highway in a truck and they're listening to the song More Than a Feeling, which I think is by Boston. Um, Maybe, yeah, it might be. Yeah, so, and it was just like a really fun moment. And they, they just had, they all had good personalities in okay. that season. So nice. I don't think there was as much uh, hatred as some yeah. of the other seasons had. By the time I started watching The Real World, it was a lot of like hate. It was a lot of like, let's. The dramatic. Let's put people in that, yeah, it's yeah. going to yeah. build crazy drama. Yeah. So. Yeah. I remember Jemmy and Knight. They're on again, off again. I remember uh, the slap. Was that in New Orleans? Yeah, that's where Irene right. maybe got slapped in the face. I can't remember. Like somebody ran to the taxi, opened it, and then just like reached in and smacked her. And I remember it was a huge thing. That sound that probably yeah. happened on every season of the Real World of the last <laughs> from like ninety seven on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there was an of uh, uh, the slap episode. <laughs> but. but no, it's that's it's cool. a good docu series. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. I'll be like halfway from your 80s and 90s experience because I'm a 90s baby, but I was still but a babe until the late 90s, really. That's true. That's so, true. Unless there's a big... But you'll still... I think you'll still recommend uh, recommend yeah. or recognize a lot of it. Unless there's so. a big uh, like Nicktoons uh, section. They do talk about you Nickelodeon. Know, a nice yeah. Blue's Clues, a nice Face, which was just... I don't think they mentioned face, but I hate face. You hate face? <laughs> yeah, dude. He always bring me out, man. Yeah, but he would always hang out with me on the days when I was sick. You I know? feel like it was teaching I, kids. I got the sea pox. I'm going <laughs> to hang out with face. I'm going to watch Bob the Builder. I'm going to watch... Uh, I feel like it was teaching the, kids the to respect uh, institutionalized authority figures without without like a reason why. Like face... I never asked for face to show up in my living room, but he did. And he was like, <laughs> face here. <laughs> I hated it. Yeah, but he wasn't like bossing people around. I don't know, man. Go back. He and wasn't look. like an authority figure. Go back and look. He was doing games. The tapes and stuff. prove it. He would. I remember there was one thing where, it, like, the face would, like zoom all over the screen. And he'd be like, "Oh, let's get our energy out." Ooh. Yeah, but that's my point. He ne- he he never he never got your <laughs> consent to get that energy out. You wow. know, just saying. That's a very uh, 2018 opinion <laughs> on a very 1990s. <laughs> 
I just don't Piece like face. Of my childhood. I just don't like face. All right, man. Well, that's fine. I watched the movie Collateral. Nice. Starring Thomas Cruise and a Jaime Fox. Yeah, uh, Katie Holmes' ex and current booze. When you told me that Jamie Foxx and Katie Holmes were currently dating, I was astonished. <laughs> yeah, you really were. That's a couple that I just don't picture. I don't either, but yeah. I guess, you know, after Tommy Love C, what do you do? Away. What do you do after Tommy C, you know? I don't know. What's their kid's name, Katie and Tom's? Surrey? Surrey. Do you think at home, Katie Holmes gets really frustrated when she's on her phone and she's like, hey, Surrey, and her phone's like, bing. It's yes. like, do you need me? <laughs> it's like, no, Surrey, unload the dishwasher. <laughs> do you think Surrey's ever had to unload the dishwasher? No, I don't think she even. I think the dishwasher it's to Surrey is like a person. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't think they have. So a she'd machine be like, why dishwasher. do I have to unload? <laughs> Jaime. Jaime. <laughs> I guess that doesn't work. You just use that one, but maybe Jimmy Fox is doing the dishes. Maybe <laughs> oh, he finds it cathartic, weird. like I do. Yeah. Maybe. Anyways, Collateral's really good. Tom Cruise is a nut in it. That's a Michael Mann, right? It's a Michael Mann. Is Tom Cruise, does he have gray, gray hair, hair or blonde yeah. hair in it? Gray hair. Gray hair, okay. I remember the the color tinging, uh, tinting is like blue, greenish blue. Um, um, in the trailer little, it was, yeah. uh, uh, in certain scenes. Yeah, there's like some scenes. It's very much but Michael Mann style, like the, the night the, with the, the light. lighting. Yeah, the yeah. lighting made it where I had a hard time telling in the Ooh. trailers if he had blonde yeah. hair or gray hair. I just said the night with the light. The Night with the Light. I don't know what that is, but just save that. Okay. That'll be something. The Night with the Light yeah. by Scott Tennant. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's a fun movie. It's interesting enough. Yeah. I wasn't like totally sold on it in the first half, and then like as it went through, I got there. But I'm not the biggest Jamie Foxx fan. And really the the end half hour is about his character like becoming a hero. Mm. And I just never had any buy-in with it. Yeah. So you know. But it's fine. If you stumble upon it, feel free to watch it it's not as long for some reason i thought every michael mann movie was like four hours long because heat is like four yeah. hours long and yeah. it's great like you're still watching heat from the last time you watched <laughs> yeah it. uh and collateral is a cool two. Oh, nice a cool nice. two. nice um but it, it's fine it didn't like blow me away i wanted yeah. to like it a lot more because i'm a big tom cruise guy mm. i also watched a star is born that's a pretty hot release people, i don't did i talk about it last week it. i don't think you did i don't think i did i don't think you did yeah so people are liking it probably should have led with that I think we recorded before you yeah. watched it. Yeah. But um, we're really burying the lead here. Uh, it's good, though. It's good. It's good. Yeah. We'll talk more about it, hopefully. Okay. Later. <laughs> yeah. Bradley Cooper's very good. Seems like a good director. I'll, good I'll, I do like me some B-Coops. A lot of people are saying, hey, Bradley Cooper, you did Sugar on Star is Born. You do Guardians 3. You'll honor James Gunn's vision. Are they vision. saying that? A lot of people are saying <laughs> that, but Bradley Cooper's like, I only want to direct movies I've written. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, too bad he didn't grab Suicide Squad 2, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then he could write it and direct it. Yeah. 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 Which apparently James Gunn is doing, and he might direct. That's, so a, we'll that's, a, that's so a good we'll move. See. That's we'll a big see. move. We'll that's see. a big move. We'll see. we'll see. I remember when they were talking about Mel Gibson directing Suicide Squad 2. That would have been nuts. That somehow is like appropriate for it, but yeah. makes me even more disinterested. I would be very interested in it. I like, think... Say what you want about Mel Gibson, and you could say a lot. But, like, yeah. he's a pretty good filmmaker, at least. I got no beef with his skills at all. I got no beef. <laughs> if you were to tell me, like, pick a director to make you less interested in ever revisiting that world again, Mel Gibson's on that short list for me. For me, David Ayer would be, like... And that's fair, too. Yeah. And I think that works. Um, yeah. At the top of my short list <laughs> might be James Gunn to get me more interested in the Yeah, world. that's one of the so. ones. Who else, like, would have got... Like, Edgar Wright could have gotten me there. Yeah. Uh, like I want one of these directors who's like fun, who like yeah. Anyone fun fired movies. on either like a Marvel movie or <laughs> yeah. a Star Wars movie would probably get me interested. Yeah, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, sure. Mm, yeah, I don't. Even, I wouldn't want them to do something this dark, but but they would make it so good, like mm. tongue in cheek dark that it'd probably be amazing. Even mm. like a uh, Colin Trevorrow, I'd be like, I'll check that out. That sounds like a terrible <laughs> matchup. You didn't see the Book of Henry, no. So I'm saying it sounds like a terrible matchup. Yeah. So I'll check it out. The thing about the book of Henry is it's very bad, <laughs> but it's bad in that it captures that like so bad that you're going to keep watching. Yeah. Yeah. Because at one point during a talent show, a pudgy eight year old white kid does a rap that's yeah. really bad. And I believe it's about Mountain Dew or Dr. Pepper. Wow. It's very bad, but I was see. I could go for that in Suicide Squad too. That's what I'm saying. Sure, it's a terrible match. Boomerang to do a rap about Vegemite. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) 
Uh, they should recast Boomerang as a pudgy eight year old. It's rumored that it's going to be like a reboot type of thing. Like a I soft mean, reboot. you might as well. Just keep keep uh, Will Smith and Margot Robbie and get rid of everyone else. And Will Smith, yeah. even there, I don't care about his character, but he he'll bring in money still. Margot Robbie, even I don't really care. I like because I wasn't too impressed. I but, get that. You know. But I still think she's the highlight of a yeah. very bad film. She's one of the few not dull moments. <laughs> there we go. Movie. There we go. Yeah, so, they should do a katana origin story. Gosh. Where the narration is just Joel Kinnaman going, her sword captures the souls of its victims. That's <laughs> all hours, he says for over, two hours. Just randomly, just says it. <laughs> yeah. Every time she gets a kill, that plays out loud. <laughs> um, that would be funny, but I guess we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe James Gunn can shoot his shot. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> wowie! You got to reset the momentum because it's time. For the 99. Get your stopwatch ready, Scott. Stopwatch is coming. It's Max's turn. He's got a tough act to follow after this American Fife. But let's see what he can do for everybody just joining us or who only barely listens. Uh, each week, Max and I will alternate pitching new ideas for the podcast after we hit 100. What are we going to do? We've had a few ideas so far. This is our fifth, no, fourth go. And Max has 90 seconds, uninterrupted, starting now. So, these days, dating is a downloadable app, right? So, most people I know that are single and are dating, they have to get these apps to meet people. It's fine. It, it, it works as a system, but there are their ups and downs. Just like there was ups and downs with normal, you know, like, the everyday dating from the years before. So... My idea for our next iteration of this podcast is called Crowdsourced Love. We get a subject who wants to uh, improve their dating game, and we, uh, we so- source out a team of experts that cover culture, politics, movies, music. We get you know, these subject matter experts, and we come up with a crowdsourced system where they all have access to this one account, and they make mm-hmm. these connections so... Boom, she, you know, he or she, the person who you've matched with, is talking about, what's your favorite movie? We get the cinema expert on there. They talk. They discuss with it. But they have to use a profile. Uh, like, they have their own parameters they can only discuss that we've established for our original dater. So they're all, like, pieced into this one flow. And then they go out there. So, boom, I don't, I don't like sushi. What about, do you like sushi? We get our, we get our cook expert on there. They discuss, you know subject matter loves sushi so therefore let's discuss it um it's you know it could be tricky because then when we have the actual date happen you know there's gonna be a lot of work there but the big thing is it's crowdsourced love and that's your time max all right i feel a little personally (laughs) invested in this because i am you know that online dater and i have max sourced (laughs) advice on my on my Tinder profile. I feel like I may have even been the inspiration for this. You you're, you definitely played in. I have other friends who have contacted sure. me asking questions before. I'm like, I've never used one of these, but I'll no. give my advice. But then it made me think, why not Why not get the experts in? And sure. you don't, you're not the focus of this. You know, you're, you're co-hosting. But maybe I want to. Oh, okay. If you want it to be. be. Well, if you want it to be, that could be like, you know, a season yep. finale even. What would you um, make me the expert on? Uh, definitely, you could, you could cover a lot of sports. Yep. You could cover a lot of... Uh, um, anything, <laughs> anything <laughs> involving, uh, like, you know, current film, you're definitely in there. Okay, um, okay. you're, you, you, with film, it's tough cause you want someone who knows what's up now. Sure. Cause a lot of dates are based around that, but then you also need like film historian type of people, yeah. um, yeah. which I could tag in on some of that. So, yeah. so, um, so what you're trying to do is build a profile for the, uh, for the target. Yeah. That is, that makes them the Renaissance man or woman. Yeah, it's it's They're like Swiss Cyrano Army de Bergerac on crack, like just like you know times a yeah. hundred basically. Yeah, it's like so. Pygmalion, digital Pygmalion. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the idea there then is you, uh, they're not answering like like I wouldn't say, you know, I like Independence Day if you were the subject. Okay. I would have information on movies you like or hate, stuff like that. Okay, so you know? our experts will. But then they can speak to your voice with expertise okay so our experts would still use the target 
artist's voice, you know, try yeah. and oh, make definitely. It, it has to be. Yeah, because then when when the date's going to be the tough execution, yeah, but exactly. we could do like um Also an recording the date's going to be the hard execution. We but, could do like an earpiece kind of yeah, thing. We yeah. could have people on location at the date <laughs> uh listening in with microphones, you know, get the yeti under a under a menu or something, yeah, yeah. you know. I I kind of like it. There's um, there's some some interesting ideas here, I think. I feel like the biggest obstacle would be let's say things go well, which is the whole goal. Yeah. Then you know, you set your, you set me off to sail, you know, with my new boo. And then I'm like, oh yeah, like when we first matched and we're talking <laughs> and everything, it was actually a team of experts talking about everything. So I don't actually know that much about sashimi. Yeah. So that there, uh, that, that's, that's hard to consider. Um, that can either just be the responsibility of the dater. Oh, okay. You know, then or, it's on them. <laughs> or it could be a follow-up show, which we could just get oh. to later. You know? Oh, your next idea. <laughs> Crowdsourced uh, mediation. I don't know. We mediation bring in a team of experts <laughs> to make the relationship work. The implication with mediation is that there's a mediator. You don't need <laughs> yeah. to add the crowdsource. <laughs> I thought when you were starting this idea that it was going to be your single friends who use online dating that are guys and girls. You match them up on the podcast. That like, could be Like a podcast yeah. blind date. Hmm. I kind of like you that. You know what? I need we'll to make more friends, away. I think. <laughs> so You already have enough guys that are on Tinder. That's true. Me. How about this? Yeah. That exact idea, but I'm just making the guys date each other. Oh. <laughs> the bro down. The bro down. Well, Max, that's a really enticing idea. And I know that's going to rank at least in the top four of our Piper. Oh, for sure. Our podcast idea. For Power sure. <laughs> Which has not been published. We've not received many much feedback on yeah, these ideas. Yeah. I think technically the leader right now would be This American Fife because at least two people that aren't us have mentioned it to us. One of them was in the room with us recording, but another listener reached out to me about This American Fife. So, so that's the leader right now. Get your yellow pages, listeners, bud. <laughs> let us know. Yo, let us, let know. us know. Crowdsource love. Does it work for you? We could even have a little theme song that's like uh, okay, Soft Cell's Tainted Love. Okay, I don't it's know. It's the 80s song. Yeah. Um, sing it. I'll just play a little. I've sung on this podcast. Yeah, but I'm not going to sing. Well, <laughs> maybe I should add on my on my Tinder bar that I'm brave. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the 90. Let's boogie on over to the third. Ooh. Yeah. Close encounters of the third kind. Max, hit me with that plot synopsis. After encountering a UFO, an electric lineman's mundane life turns upside down as his obsession with the experience grows. Yeah, that that very much plays up the micro side of this story. Yeah, yeah. And the beauty of all these alien invasion movies, in my opinion, um, are the micro and the macro scale. And that's kind of, even with like Independence Day, which mm-hmm. I don't love, but <laughs> um, even in those stories, the the best ones are the ones that really stand out aren't just about this large scale conflict yeah, it's yeah. about the family side it's about the human yeah. impact you know and what it ind- brings out the human in people with more independence than day aliens. that's a good example because uh while it's not the most in-depth yeah. movie they do succeed in creating family bonds and relationships that sure. you at least can find intriguing enough to watch yeah um i don't know if the sequel did that because i've never seen it yeah that's probably and it fine. was pretty much uh tanked uh well it does have some family aspects with liam true. hemsworth that's true he was um, on it right I yeah, Liam was he someone's son or something? Well, he's uh, Chris Hemsworth's brother. Chris uh, Hemsworth's brother. Oh yeah, yeah. I think there's a main character who might be Will Smith's S- character son, son so or stepson. They're or trying to do yeah. some. Yeah, yeah, no, I know that, but I was just doing a bit on. Uh, yeah, Hemsworth. No, I got you. That's why I got confused though. Yeah. So your it joke landed was fine. very well. <laughs> your joke was fine. You know, a new podcast idea: crowdsource banter. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me tell you this: we have a uh, gallery of jumping back to your hot take earlier. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the failures with this film is that the characters are not very dynamic. Yep, I would agree with that. And I think that that leads to the, while the micro side is what I just described, I think that's almost the weakest part of this film. Yeah. So Um, I can perfectly get why this is your least favorite of those films that we watched. And that hot take isn't meant to say this is a bad movie. it's very well made. And I think this is actually a good good showing of how Rotten Tomatoes is an imperfect system. This is 96%. And 
I don't think there's a ton of people watching the movie today that's like, yeah, that's an A plus movie. It's better than Arrival, Signs, and Contact. You'd get mixed ratings of all those, but just because this is a higher Rotten Tomatoes yeah. percent doesn't mean it's objectively better than those movies. And like Arrival is the perfect example. Um, with with nuance in the scenario, it makes yeah. more sense because you could say, of the amount of critics they polled. Yeah. 97% of them found this movie to be a positive experience. And a positive experience can be, yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. It was fine. Exactly. Or it can be, this is one of the better movies so I've then, ever watched. So uh, then with Arrival, that's what, like 94, 93%, 96%? Um, well, this is 96. This is Arrival was 94, I think. 94, yeah. So then the same statement, you just say the same thing, but with 94%, you know, and it's, yeah. it doesn't give you a and, full-on qualitative response. And Arrival probably had 300 reviews and close encounters of the third kind has 58 yeah, yeah so um it's not a perfect barometer we've never claimed it to be we've yeah. always kind of warned that but it's fun for the pod yeah and it's it is interesting because i mean that percentage difference isn't that big but i'm sure yeah, if you had 300 mute. reviews of yeah. this movie the percentage would probably change a lot especially if if they're yeah. old versus if they're new for sure so for sure there's definitely but, uh, some considerations to make there. But regardless, it's not. this isn't like a let's shit on Close Encounters because no, no, no. it is a good movie. Yeah. But um, I think one of the telling signs for me about the micro, the personal level stories failing is that before we start the podcast, I always write down the actors and the characters so I can remember them. Mm-hmm. And I could only think of one character's name. Right, yeah. I can only think Roy Neary, yeah, played yeah. by Richard Dreyfus. He is the main character. And he's excellent. Yeah. Legitimately yeah. very yeah. good. Very good. Um, but... Beyond that, I couldn't think of any of the other characters' names. I could think of their roles, so I was looking and I was seeing a oh, Bob Balaban. He played the translator, mm-hmm. but beyond other than the fact that he was the translator, there's not much to him. Yeah. All I know is at the start of the movie, he says like, "My French isn't that great," or something like that. Yeah. Um, which I did find it weird that they never replaced him at any point. Yeah. Like he starts, he's like, "My French isn't that great," and then the movie keeps going. And they're like, stick around. Yeah. <laughs> I remembered uh, Barry's name, the kid, Barry, because the kid. they say yeah. it nonstop. That's like the yeah. only line delivered toward half of, uh, what's her name, Melinda? Melinda Dillon's the actress. Yeah. Jillian Guiler. G-U-I-L-E-R. Guiler. Um, yeah, half of Jillian's lines are just her Barry. saying Barry. Yeah. So it's like, uh, okay, that's yeah. easy to remember Barry. We get it. <laughs> I don't even know if Barry speaks in the movie. Um, he does. But I know uh, he apparently was a very good he child actor toys. at the time. Um, yeah. His nickname was One Take Carrie. His, his, the actor's name was Carrie Guffey. Yeah. And he got all the shots in one take, and Spielberg was like, hell yeah. Yeah, and for a so, child actor, for, yeah. what was he, probably three or four? Yeah. So, that I mean, that's very impressive. Yeah, so um, that probably helps with, like, the scheduling aspect, too. I was reading that Stanley Kubrick wanted Carrie Guffin to play... Um, Danny Torrance. Danny and yeah. Torrance, yeah, yeah, in The Shining. That makes sense. Yeah, and, and we even watching this movie, we were like... We surely we've seen this kid somewhere else, yeah. but w- looking through his filmography, he hasn't nothing. He didn't do anything then, else, yeah. even as a kid, yeah. really. So, yeah. Um, which, I mean, with children actors, I feel like it's kind of yeah. Crap some shit. of them go on to become greats, and some yeah. just they just did it for a bit. Yeah. Maybe their parents wanted them to try, and maybe they wanted to try. No. Yeah. Maybe they wanted that dough. <laughs> yeah. Make make that bread. Son. Yeah. <laughs> Farm to table <laughs> dough. <laughs> so you know uh, this script. Bank to check. Money. <laughs> uh, Spielberg was originally, uh, well, he's credited as the writer, but it was yeah. originally written by Paul Schrader. I didn't know that. And uh, Spielberg changed so much of it. That of he the was the writer. That he, that Paul Schrader removed his name from the project. Just said, this isn't my script anymore. It's cool. Y'all do what you want. Did Paul Schrader write anything else significant? Uh, I think so. Um, <laughs> I had that up earlier. But uh, basically Spielberg then, since he had so many rewrites, he just went ahead and claimed the credit for it. Uh <laughs> Um, we talked in the past. He with, wrote Taxi Driver is probably the biggest thing oh, he's yeah, for, and for Raging sure. Bull. So okay, so some Scorsese. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've talked a bit, especially around like Solo and stuff, about how the DGA, the Directors Guild, is big about how to get directing credit. You have to do certain percentage of the movie, stuff like that. Is the Writers Guild similar? I feel like it's more loosey goosey because sometimes you'll see these movies come out with seven writers. It uh, it's not how the director's guild has the clause where it has to be like a singular person or yeah. if you're a team you have to like work together constantly yeah it's you credit everyone who worked on it basically yeah. as long as their work is still in there that's interesting then that they didn't even give paul schrader partial yeah credit. or like story so, credit or something yeah. i don't know if yeah. the rules have changed since then and i bet that's you some I of it is yeah. especially since a lot of times you're adapting existing properties you're 
purchasing the rights to adapt these properties and the original writers probably getting that's yeah. probably a negotiation well, thing like whether you get story by or written by yeah, credit yeah. and stuff now like definitely that. it is yeah. um i i see here also West, the though. uh they couldn't leave the film without a writer so that's one of the reasons spielberg oh, took sure. the credit so oh uh, so like uh rather than so there was a time when i guess the script was so bastardized from paul Sh- paul schrader was that his yeah name? yeah his original that they just weren't going to have a writer on it? Uh, well, I guess like that was the dilemma they had. Yeah. It seems like it would happen instantly. God, like movie like Paul no Schrader's writer? like, this isn't my movie. I'm going to yeah. go do my other thing. Um, y'all have at it. That's a cool move from him because, I mean, it's a pretty iconic film and it's a big movie. Um, and to just kind of accept that it's not your yeah. film anymore. Yeah. We see so many movies where it's like, it's based on this, but it's nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, but the writer still gets credit and... If it's, it's based a on a story, I get stuff. it. Like, if this was based off a novel written by Paul sure. Schrader, I would sure. get still wanting the credit. But yeah. Like, The Iron Giant was a adaptation of a 60s book called The Iron Man. Yeah. But I don't think that that author had any credit on it. So, so I don't know. It's always interesting. I'd love to be a fly on that wall. So for, I had a dream uh, once that I finished my novel and uh-huh. that it was purchased to be a movie. And I got written by credit. And I got you hired <laughs> as the screenwriter, and they had you work with uh, whatever the guy that screen wrote the Mummy was. Okay. So yeah. it was written by me, screen written by Max Rivera, and whatever that guy's name is. And I was an EP too. Nice. Like a Phil and Christopher Miller to direct. That must be. It a landed really wild well. novel, dude. It's my time travel novel. Okay, let's not talk about it. No, please don't. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Speaking of directors and Steven Spielberg, uh, this is one of the first films to have a special edition slash yeah. director's cut slash uh, whatever the most recent one is. It was but. one of Spielberg's first films to have that. That's what I read. Okay, well, I, I saw that it was yeah. one of the first films in general, but um, it probably is also one of the first yeah, ones. But uh, one of the things probably was, to have like a major re-release with a director's cut yeah. attached, and, and it title. was because they um, Paramount, I believe, was the studio that made it. They were kind of having some financial issues, so they kind of rushed it for mm-hmm. its, what, 1977 release? Or 76? Yeah. 77 was the original release, yeah. I think. So it was late 77, and then it was originally going to be a summer 78 film, mm-hmm. but they pushed Spielberg to get it out. And it was a financial success. Yeah. It had a $20 million budget, and it made $135 million domestic, like $300 million worldwide. A lot of these older movies... I. I can't find like opening weekend stats, like weekend yeah. by weekend numbers, so I don't know how it opened, but I imagine it probably opened well. Obviously, uh, in 77, Star Wars murdered the box office. Yeah. But I wonder, did this one come out before that? This probably came out after because I'm pretty sure this was towards the end of the year. And I don't if, have that. If Paramount number in front wanted of this rushed out, that would make more yeah. sense. Like, and let's it get our was originally movie a summer, out. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they were very secretive about the filming of this because they didn't want someone to mm. see what they were doing and make a really cheap, version. crappy version yeah. that would kind of pull the rug out from under this one. So um, they had like, and this is kind of common to have like screening fake titles, fake and, titles yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And um, they were so tight about who could be on set. Most of the uh, scenes were filmed on a hangar, like all the stuff with mm. the alien part, like mm-hmm. a, a single airline hangar. One time, Steven Spielberg forgot his ID, and they didn't let him on set. That's amazing. Yeah, so that's really um, funny, especially because we all know what Spielberg looks like. Yeah. You know, if he walked into a grocery store, I'd be like, "Holy shit, that's Spielberg!" Yeah. I'm sure just studio lot guy in 1976 yeah. or seven was just like, "Yeah, buddy, yeah. I'm the director too. <laughs> I need your badge." And in 77, particularly, I didn't. I meant to look this up, but I didn't. But Spielberg wasn't the like Spielberg's almost a genre now. That's yeah, how iconic yeah, he is. Yeah. But at this time, he had done Jaws already, so he was definitely a name people knew. But he didn't ha- have this thirty-year catalog of like world-renowned films. So what what else had he done prior to Close Encounters? Uh, prior to Close Encounters, like you said, Jaws. Yeah. He did the Sugarland Express, um, which I don't know what that is. <laughs> Savage, something evil, Duel, which is a TV movie where a uh, tractor trailer and a car are, like road fighting, kind of. So um, a classic. And uh, he had done a bunch of shorts and stuff before that. Uh, this was really... So this was like his second big release. Yeah. 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 From this, uh, from here, he did, he did 1941 and then Raiders of the Lost Ark, which yeah. that's really and what... And then E.T. Yeah. And then, yeah. So and from then Raiders was... to E.T., it's like where everyone knew yeah. who he was. He yeah. reached icon status already. Yeah. Um, so getting turned off uh, set is yeah. sort of yeah. understandable. Yeah. It would be like Josh Trank being turned off the solo set. God. And then he was actually turned off the nice. solo set. Probably um, through a little fit. Let's be real. Yeah, yeah, but uh, 
and then, there's one josh tranks suicide squad 2 i just had to throw that back in there i'm in hey i'm uh i like a good redemption story sometimes and i do feel like like it, he's an easy punching bag after all the stuff with fantastic four but i i do sort of side with him to an extent because that movie watching it feels so much like what he was making was taken from him by that yeah, studio yeah. And he's got that Al Capone movie coming out with Tom Hardy. We might be seeing Trank again. That's all I'm saying. All right. We'll see. We'll see. I was just throwing him into that yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. So this music's by John Williams. Yeah. It's good music. Yeah. Uh, sure. Interesting interesting point with the music is uh, this film is actually edited to its own music. Yeah, which is the backwards kind of rarity. Yeah, yeah. way. Usually and, yeah. you have like, you know, uh, I forgot the name for him. Uh, just like... Um. Yeah, like the sample tracks. Kind yeah, like of, sample uh, music used to edit to just that, to have filler. Um, um, there's every a frame of painting yeah, did that yeah. big video about how Marvel used, or not necessarily, they, but they a were, lot of movies. They talked use, about Marvel, but yeah, a lot of movies yeah. use these tracks where, like, they'll edit a movie and they'll say, "Here's the Chariots of Fire song. We edited it to this. Make a song like this, or yeah. that captures this feel." Yeah. But um, Spielberg and Williams, they wanted the movie to have a very lyrical feel, mm-hmm. which watching it, I didn't feel. But now afterward, I, I kind of get. I, but like, that's such an abstract statement. Yeah. I want the movie to have a lyrical feel. I barely know what that means I other think, than having a rhythm to yeah, it. Yeah, like rhythm a momentum, is where my but, mind goes. Um, and no. the last, I know Spielberg said the last 35 minutes of this was the hardest editing job he's ever had. Yeah. Um, and the editor is, uh, this is the first time he worked with... Uh, Michael Kahn, who would go on to collaborate with him for the next 40 years. Yeah. but uh, This was nominated for the Oscar for Best Editing. Makes sense. It's, it's edited yeah, pretty good, but the, the last it. 35 minutes of it are pretty much barely any dialogue. Yeah. It's music communicating with music. Yeah, and then a lot of just visuals. Yeah, a lot splendors. of crazy visuals. Yeah. And it it's kind of where the movie hits its home run for what it is. Um, it's definitely the iconic moments of the movie. Yeah, so it's, you know, they build up all this mystery, and then that's where everything kind of unfolds, where... Yeah. You're not necessarily getting answers. You're getting an yeah. answer that it's the aliens are here and they're communicating. And this is first contact, like for real, for real. Yeah. And then, like, it just goes off. You know, yeah. just it just does its thing and leaves. Um, so it's it's interesting because it's it's not it's not like a mystery that was building up over the course of the movie necessarily. Yeah. The opening scene of the movie, they like they don't explain it, and I forgot about it, and it would be easy to forget about it because it's so separate from the rest of the story. But it's like these government officials going to this mysterious desert mm-hmm. area and finding all these world war ii planes and being yeah. really perfectly uh preserved as if yeah. they just showed up yeah. from the minute they vanished and they're very excited about it yeah and, and it is from a famous flight that did vanish yeah i was yeah. reading about that um like u.s navy flight 41 or something, or something yeah, yeah. Uh, 1941 there we go world war ii um number 23 <laughs> uh then that's basically left aside, and then when you have the big reveal with the aliens coming down with the communication working, and then the alien ship opens, and a bunch of World War II era yeah. people come that's out. The first... Actually, people from all eras come out, because there's people in yeah. like, partridge clothing, yeah. which it probably isn't a, a statement, but partridge clothing? Like pilgrim clothing. <laughs> pilgrim clothing. There we go. I thought you meant the partridge family. So I, just... I kind of did, but I don't even know if that <laughs> That'd works. be like the 60s, so... Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. There was pilgrim clothing. The Vavitch clothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, um, there is and a bunch then all of, these World yeah. War II pilots. And, I think I saw one Barry. island type of person. Yeah. yeah. Like a tribal person. So it was like contact had already been made. Um, yeah. Just yeah. Like they had been taking yeah. people, but obviously these aliens exist in a different form of space time where they can just yeah. instantly show up or they light travel, light speed travel so that these yeah. people haven't aged at all. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's interesting. And the alien visuals here are pretty strange because yeah. the first one you see is like a spider-esque slender man. Yeah. He has like tentacle arms like waving yeah. around all and, three of us went ah when yeah. we watched it but then that's the only time you see an alien well, like yeah that. they show him like <laughs> holding his arms out yeah and then he's just gone i was um, reading that um they had tried a bunch of different ways to show the aliens and this was one of them that was actually like a marionette puppet mm. and they had like a puppet master come in and design this and originally like the skin was kind of translucent you could see like the heart beating and all that and i can't remember yeah. now if you could see it there but logistically it just didn't work and yeah. so what they ended up having is kind of like your classic image of an alien with like the big eyes and they had like forms. children yeah walking around in yeah. these suits there was children's they had the they had alien kind of classic bodies that we yeah. know but they had more eyes like smaller version of et like that yeah still the blue and white like 
humanoid eyes. But yeah. then at the very end, they showed one that had more of a structure like E.T., but had the classic alien eyes. Yeah. So we saw, I guess, three models of alien. They, they tried a couple. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting to show because it shows that it's not just one type of person. Mm-hmm. It's not like one group um, coming here, like an arrival or in signs. Yeah. Or there's one alien model. Yeah. yeah. So it's what's, like one nation coming. What still freaks me out, though, is that they're all naked. Um, yeah. And I just wonder, like, why humans decide we're clothed, but these are all yeah. just naked all the time. Or are they not naked and we're just The Bible talks about that, right? <laughs> Like uh, Adam and Eve, they cover themselves up, and it's like a great shame. Like, yeah, why yeah. do you feel this shame to cover yourselves up? You're so these my aliens just never that. committed original sin. Yeah, they're perfect. There we go. Um, it's an interesting scene, though, that whole end scene. So we're kind of yeah. talking all over, but because um, like you said, there isn't much dialogue. We're very much watching from the perspective of like Roy Neary mm-hmm. and um, Jillian, who um, they had a contact with the alien earlier in the movie, and they're having all these crazy mental images and stuff. So they're drawn to this location, the devil's thumb, devil's Devil's tower, the devil's tower. Yeah. Maybe it looked like a thumb to me. (laughs) Um, (laughs) the devil's tower. And when they finally get there, they get like kidnapped, not kidnapped. They get captured by like the military and then they escape. And then they end up at the hangar where all this is happening. Yeah. So we don't fully know what's happening either. So I felt like we were kind of watching it from their perspective. For sure. Yeah. But there's just like, a guy playing a Casio keyboard, playing these notes yeah. to communicate with them. They had touched on how they're developing these communication systems earlier, and they just go back and forth, like playing the sequence of notes that is supposed to. I don't know if they said what it's supposed to mean. It's it's like it's supposed to be welcoming or something. Yeah, like it's that. like they're they've they had assumed it was a language thing. Like yeah. that was how they communicate the yeah. uh, the species is. Yeah. Um, so, so they do go back and forth, yeah. and the alien is playing notes back to our Casio keyboard guy. Uh, the alien's music, Way music, it's their communication, yeah. but and, but it was also they used a tuba to um, <laughs> That's get cool. it because it's like yeah. very bassy bum, bum, and stuff. Yeah, yeah it is. It's like, it is. sounds very alien, yeah. which is, I didn't notice it, but now that, once I read that in the IMDb, I was like, yeah, that's it's what It's added more <laughs> complex. I yeah. remember like it was just a richer like variety of sounds in there for sure and it makes sense that a, a yeah. tuba versus like a synthesizer would have mm-hmm. a di- two different distinct sounds basically and it makes sense that this alien force that is probably speaking in their native tongue quote unquote or yeah. some type of communication is going to have more complexity and more things to say than us the humans the earthlings who are just playing these there was like 10 total notes that were on that sheet yeah that they could communicate with so there were different levels of like understanding of how to communicate it's interesting um to think of like this contact arrival. and arrival mm-hmm. because they all do communication and they all do it in a different way with uh with contact i don't it's, remember contact it's based on math where they had that primer That's right. uh, That's right. primer or whatever the primer. Uh, to to discover where the first thing they're mentioning is um using uh like binary or something to d- establish true and false statements like yeah. one plus one is two one plus one is not three so yeah. stuff like that um, so they showed that whole chart and then built out the 3D thing eventually. Yeah. We just talked about Arrival. They do a really interesting take yeah, on language that, in there. The, the language is like the focus of yeah, Arrival. Yeah. And, oh God, Arrival is so good. But the beauty of it in Arrival is it's not just the language of communicating with um, this alien people. It's also the communication within our own groups here on Earth. Yeah, within, on, a, on a micro and macro scale. Yeah. And then also uh, how our languages as a whole... Mm-hmm understand their language yeah. so i mean there's so many different like nuances with it it's really cool yeah. um this one obviously is more simplified in the fact that it leads up to this point and we're like you said we're in yeah. pov of uh two randos basically and, and, and this movie isn't like arrival is very much that's the focus it, of it, arrival, and it has like moral yeah. and ethical and philosophical discussions within yeah. that and this isn't really acting on that level no, there's a huge moral and ethical like failure of a character in this film yeah and uh, i actually think it's the, the most, main character i think it's the most interesting yeah. aspect of the movie so just let's set aside the whole ending sequence which we can talk about again if we want to and i do have one more thing i want to mention with it but roy neary uh richard dreyfus's character is kind of the main character he has this contact with the aliens and then he has these images of this the devil's tower yeah and all he can do is see it and then the same thing with jillian she's drawing it everywhere he's sculpting it out um, but he's clearly like mentally breaking down and there's one boiling point in the movie where he had just like had a dinner like at dinner 
he was like mumbling and his family was like snap out of it all this and he was like i'm still your dad like it's just something happened i'm trying to deal with it yeah and then the next scene is he's in the shower mm-hmm. on laying on the ground the water's running yeah. and he's like now he's like crying bro- totally broken yeah. down he's yeah. like i don't know what to do and to me it, it's almost like a um a scene of like mental illness yeah um and no now with the timing you know 77 that's after world war ii or world war, it is after world war ii yeah. it's after vietnam and PTSD at this time wasn't really a big discussion point. I, I still refer like. to as shell shock at the yeah. time. Yeah. But this could easily be a commentary on that because yeah. people were coming back from Vietnam not right. Yeah. You know? Roy Neary's clearly not right, and his family doesn't handle it well at all. His wife's screaming at him. His kids are like slamming doors and they're like, Stop it, Dad. Yeah, but see, the thing is they were screaming the whole time anyway, even yeah. before he well, was that's true. They in were a bad shitty. spot. But um, to so, me, it was like the masculine character, the the provider of the family, having this mental breakdown, and then the family handles it poorly, screams at him, makes him feel like shit, and then leaves, abandons him, so and that sucks. For me, I I like interpret it the other way, where he's so focused on this one singular thing that doesn't affect his family at all that he gets fired. He doesn't care he's fired. Yeah. He's still carving mountains. Um, you know, his, his family, they're like crying, staring at him like, dude, you're fucking nuts now because he's acting completely different. Like before he's like, let's go to Pinocchio. I'm mad you guys don't want to see Pinocchio, but I'm still going to take you. Uh, I want to go goofy golf. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, we can do Pinocchio or goofy golf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then it's like, he's so focused on the self then. I mean, he's, you know, going out, he, he wakes them all up to go, uh, sight see or whatever. Um, when the helicopter's that whole I was actually thing. reading um, that was inspired quick. yeah yes yeah. this was inspired by a moment in Spielberg's uh youth where his family just suddenly woke him and his um, I think he had brothers and sisters up in the middle of the night drove him out no explanation to watch a meteor shower yeah so it was inspired by that. but anyways, and that but. that's uh, that's cool I do like that yeah. and I do like the sequence with it but uh it's just no. it's f- frustrating for me because he doesn't ever seem to care about his family and once they leave, he's like, oh, come on, come on. And then that's it. And then he yeah. just goes back in the house and starts carving his giant devil's yeah. tower. From then on, he doesn't give a shit. Yeah. And see, that's funny. Like, that's funny that you and I are kind of coming at it from totally different sets because I see it as it's not his fault because he doesn't have control over these thoughts. Like, that's yeah. how I'm kind of getting that, like, mental illness. But I guess like, it's, if you have, it's... like, OCD thoughts and stuff like that, you don't have control over the obsessive nature of them. To a degree, yes, I agree yeah. on that. But I guess for me, it's just he didn't show any care about it. Like he wasn't yeah. like, "I'm doing this so I can get my mind right and get back to my family." Yeah, he see, wasn't I, like that at all. They didn't and then, say that, but that's kind of what I felt was happening. He was trying to solve it. He for kisses that. Jillian, and then he's yeah. like, "I want a jumpsuit. I want to get on this ship." Well, yeah, that's the other thing. At the end of the movie, <laughs> the um, the French guy who is played by uh, Francois Truffaut. Yeah. Um, he plays Claude Lacombe, who is kind of like the leader of this, not United Nations, but this like international force trying yeah. to solve this. He tells him, he's like, you're such, like, you're so lucky because he's getting to be one of the uh, astronauts, I guess you'd call him, one of the people chosen to possibly go with the aliens. And the aliens do choose him. Yeah. Like, they, it appears they, they like don't they show only you. choose him. Yeah. They don't show you if everybody gets to go, yeah. but there's like probably 15 or 20 people all in these red jumpsuits lined up, and the aliens like walk right up to him and pull him off. Yeah. And then the next scene is him on the ship, and he's like looking around and on. You don't see any of the others. So, yeah. You had mentioned when you were watching, like, it would suck to be one of those <laughs> other guys probably training for this. Yeah. And then this random guy just shows up, burnt face, yeah. gets a jumpsuit, gets pulled on. I think I called him Johnny C. Trucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Johnny C. Trucker. He just looks like your average, like, blue collar dude yeah. from this your era. Your a- average Iowa guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, he does abandon his family there. And Spielberg has said, if you were to make the film uh, the fi- the film again today, that he- that wouldn't have been part of it. Oh, that's interesting. Roy wouldn't abandon his family. Yeah. He'd go back to his family. What's interesting with it is, since then, I know Spielberg's gone through divorce. And mm. I want to say his parents divorced when he was young, but I don't remember. I don't know. Um... Or if they divorced when he was older. But yeah. I know he himself has been through some divorces, or at least one. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if that did affect it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, when he went back and did uh, the... There was a third special yeah. director's cut, or whatever you call it. And, release uh, yeah, Re-release. Retouch, thing. Yeah. And that one, I think, might have been after. So I'm not sure if he really noticed yeah. the difference there. But it is interesting that we see the two different takes on it. Yeah. And, uh I do think for sure his family was not easy to deal with. Yeah. Um, well, he he also wasn't either. But, yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's there is some nuance there. It's just 
it, I think it's now like say, with it's the films, most interesting part of the movie. Yeah, and now with films, we expect more of that, especially yeah. with this kind of film. Yeah, and I think Signs, Contact, and Arrival all deliver on that yeah. to varying yeah. degrees. But I think they all like I've gushed about Signs so much when we watched it, and it's since. about faith. Yeah, it's about it's about that battle of faith, and it does it so well. Yeah, and more so than any of these, God's not dead. Uh, I can only imagine the Shack movie Signs. Contact makes, even has some of that too with faith. Contact yeah. definitely does, yeah. and more interestingly than those ones I just mentioned. But yeah. faith is impossible to have like an interesting discussion about when you're coming at it with that lens, like yeah. the pure religious oh, lens. Yeah, yeah. But when you have these test of faith kind of things, it's so much more interesting. And to me. the thing with it too is, uh, if you're really, and this is a way off subject for yeah, us, but gone. if you're really trying to, uh, is the word proselytize? Uh, I think that's a word. Like, yeah, yeah, where you're preaching to others yeah. about your faith. Yeah, it makes more sense to preach using. You know, not even that you're preaching, but to bring up discussions of faith yeah. and something like signs versus something like one of those movies that are heavily focused yeah. for a Christian audience, yeah. because that movie is just reinforcing what they think. Exactly. If you want to take a crowd and introduce them to new thoughts or even old thoughts that they may have yeah. not considered ever, that's a much better avenue for it's it. It's more nuanced. Yeah. It's more relatable. So, and as as an art form, it's just more dynamic i guess for sure. so yep. um this one it's um, lacking I, that i didn't of, know that yeah. uh i thought i didn't know you that was your thought with the roy uh with the roy neary stuff <laughs> yeah so that's interesting that we came at it from like totally different sides and like yeah, there's and, not a right way and to hearing look at yours it. like i get a lot of what you're saying yeah, and i his get family what you're was saying super too. shitty yeah. um that's undeniable what's yep. interesting is terry gar wanted to be the jillian character that is but, uh, interesting. Terry Gar that's is what she, like, a much tried out bigger for. name than Melinda Dillon. So yeah, yeah. I wonder if that's part of that. I don't know. I don't know. But don't know. Um, it is interesting. Uh, the movie was nominated for eight Oscars. Not Best Picture, though. Hmm. It won uh, for cinematography, which that I get because there's yeah. a lot of really cool shots yeah. in the movie. And there's a lot of, yeah, just beautiful yeah. effects. And it's just, it's well composed. When we were watching all the house stuff with the kid, I was like, oh, yeah. wow, this is just all of Stranger Things. Like, yeah. they watched this a shit ton to get half yeah. of their compositions, and it shows. And with the lighting with it, it's amazing. I mean... yeah, Oh, yeah, especially yeah. when they're in the house and the aliens are outside. Yeah. All the openings in the house having just, like, those different colored lights, like, down the fireplace, yeah. out the windows. It's the arcade scene. You brought it up when we yeah. were watching. It's from the season two of Stranger Things. Yeah. That arcade thing where he opens the door and it's crazy outside. That's just this movie. Yep. And I'm not dissing them. Hell yeah, I use no, it. I mean, it makes sense. And when you're thing. going for that vibe... And it shows perfect. how visionary... Steven Spielberg was yeah. even in his earliest works. Yeah, yeah. That um, these types of scenes that we see are still influencing the most popular works today. And speaking of Spielberg's earliest works, in like 1963, when he was about 16, he uh, he had made a short film. Um, well, I guess it wasn't actually a short film. It was an independent film because it was 140 minutes long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> called Firelight. Maybe that's short for Michael Mann. Yeah. <laughs> Am I right? It's called Firelight, and it was part of his inspiration for okay. doing this when he was later on like an official, yeah. you know, director and filmmaker. <laughs> an official um, director. Yeah. So Not when he was making 16, short little one yeah. forties. So, uh, <laughs> that film cost five hundred bucks, which I guess he got from his dad. He showed it at a local theater. He sold actually a good amount of uh, tickets. He managed to make one dollar profit. Hey. Um, and he thinks that somebody. Uh, was mischarged because apparently the theater could hold like 500 total and uh, it cost him 500 bucks. So it, it he literally sold 500 tickets. He shouldn't have Man, made standing profit, room only, <laughs> but he got a dollar out of it. So I think he he was saying somebody got charged yeah. twice or something. Yeah. So and he bought an apple with that dollar, planted those seeds. That apple tree still at his property. <laughs> That's so stupid. I can't believe you let me say I that. I thought you were going to lead into like owning Apple computer stock yeah. or something. Yeah. So. Steven Spielberg owns Apple. <laughs> yeah. Spielberg kept uh, watching a bunch of movies while making this and kept getting more ideas and adding to what he wanted to do, no. which probably might have wrecked that schedule he was working on anyway. So No wonder the script was nothing like the guy's original. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> it seems like, like you said, this is very much early Spielberg, and it's, yeah. it's almost him finding the way of the Spielberg. You know? The like, way of the Spielberg. He, he, he almost like developed his own language in this film. Um, yeah. And with Jaws, you see a lot of his his big stuff he does now. And in this one, I think it's like a huge influence. So I'm yeah. glad we got to watch it to kind of piece apart. Yeah, I, I think the thing you can usually tell with a director from beginning to end is like there's certain directors who have a very clear visual eye. Yeah. And Spielberg's one of them from, from the point of Jaws and in this movie and in his future works. There's just something about the way he does this camera yeah. that is so like it makes everything so familiar. Yeah. Like he, um, I, w I think it might have been in Every Frame of Painting that was talking about those these long one takes the you'll see yeah, yeah. yeah. Now spielberg's oneers they're not these 20 minute oneers but he'll have like a four minute oneer where 
he's doing really interesting things with the background and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Like in Jaws, there's a long one take when they're on the ferry going across the beach or to the island. I don't remember where they were going, but everything in the background of the shot is moving. Yeah. And they have to film the scene in exactly 96 seconds because that's how long the ferry ride takes. Yeah. And how he'll do these oneers and then also have other cameras going. And so it'll be like a three minute oneer with just a, the occasional like reverse shot yeah. thrown in and stuff like that. And, like in Raiders of the Lost Ark, that scene, the drinking game scene, where it's on the big burly person doing the shots, and then it slowly goes over to yeah. Um, I and forget he, the character's he does, name, but uh, it's very Spielberg. And though. the shots are framed like traditional shots would be, just from a still camera. Yeah. But using a moving camera, it's super cool. I yeah. mean, he's definitely I mean, has his command of that kind of stuff, yeah. and he always tells you exactly where to look with the camera. In yeah, a way he that does is, a good job of building the yeah, focus. It's it's crazy. I mean, the yeah. the guy is so skillful. It's it's yeah. it's a no wonder that he's you know, this Spielberg yeah, guy knows he's what go he's places. doing. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, like with the focus, it's interesting that you say that because, like, using the internal shot or the interior shots of the house when, um, when Julian and, or Jillian and Barry are in there mm-hmm. as the aliens are trying to abduct Barry. Um, there'll be moments where like the doggy door will open and you'll see the light come out or Barry opens the, the door where you don't know those things are going to happen, but he builds the anticipation by like just subtly shifting the frame to where the door is yeah. in the center. Yeah. So when Barry opens it, boom, it's right there. You know exactly what's happening. That's just really masterful yeah. filmmaking. Um, also the, uh, where when Roy, uh, Roy, is that his name? Yeah. Roy, Roy uh, when he makes the tower in his living oh, God, room, that's such a cool scene. The shot has the tower in the background. Yeah. Well, in, like, and kind of in the middle ground. In, yeah. In the foreground, there's a TV. Small TV playing the news already. uh, Roy is shifting between the two on the phone, I guess talking to his wife. Yeah. um, Getting into an argument with her. About it. She's going to stay with her sister and all that. And And, uh, he's covered in mud, head to toe. He's been carving this all day after they left. Uh, Yeah, true. (laughs) We do hope so. Um, But every time he's in the foreground himself, his face is away from the TV. Yeah. And they're showing the Devil's Tower. And then he walks away. And he looks looks at the screen. Yeah. It's identical. Yeah. And so the whole time it's like leading it where you know it's going to happen, yeah. but you don't know when. And so it, it puts you on edge because you're like, oh my God, look at it, yeah. look at it, look at it. And the it, it's a regular news story, which always like will come to a natural end and they'll be like, and back to the studio. And I, you could feel that starting to happen. Yeah. But like, yeah. And the government is here doing this, 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 and this. And so you're like, oh, this news story is about to end. Yeah. And it's so good. And, and the other thing that's good is the viewer knows that what he sees and what he's crafting is yeah. already this Yeah, we've already tower. been revealed that. Yeah, yeah. they've already explained Which is a great that with other We talk about it all the time. Yeah, yeah, the viewer knows and the character doesn't. Yeah. And it's it's a really cool the way that whole scene is yeah. put together. And what I like also is afterwards there's a call out to it from the uh, the French guy, uh Lacombe. Yeah. He says when he's talking to the general, the general's like, "Okay, but how come these guys are just showing up? Like yeah. what's so special about them?" He's like the French dude was saying he imagines that there's probably hundreds or maybe even thousands of people who are having these visions. Yeah. These 25 that showed up were just lucky enough to catch to the news here. broadcast at the same yeah. time. So if they hadn't seen the news, bro- news broadcast, they would have never showed up, basically. Yeah. And those are so compelled because the other people are probably still out there making their artwork. They just never saw the news. Yeah. And or I, they I were across little, the world. They saw yeah. the news, but they just didn't have exactly. to get so there. Exactly. So I love that little story bit where it, yeah. it explains it perfectly because if not, you might be like, that's a plot hole. Yeah. How come other people didn't show up? You mm-hmm. know, or... How come these are the people? It tells you exactly why. Yeah. You don't need it to tell you why, and it's very subtle. Yeah, but it it's does. not exposition yeah, at all. No, it's not like, at all. But it does explain things yeah, in a this, natural this way. This movie does that a good yeah, amount it's, where it's, they give it you It does really good storytelling. Yeah. So. Um, there's a couple areas like in... Um, so since they moved that release up for financial reasons, but it was such a big success, Paramount... I think it was Paramount. I keep saying that, but I can't remember, honestly. Yeah. They said to Spielberg, well, this is such a big success. We'll give you more money to finish the scenes you want because there was things that he had to cut yeah and one of them was the interior shot of the ship and that's like the last three minutes of the movie maybe where roy's on the ship you see it looks like atoms almost just like kind of coming together it it doesn't add that much to the movie i don't think it adds to the alien quality of the aliens Mm -hmm. but even spielberg now in retrospect is like i didn't really need to film that yeah like it doesn't really add anything to the movie but it's interesting and that's what we watch was the special okay yeah, yeah yeah Because we were debating which one to rent. Yeah, um, because there's like three versions on yeah, Amazon, and yeah. they all have different run times. And none of them and, tells you which one's which. Yeah, which is annoying. Well, the one other thing I had was um, there's scenes where the government is poisoning like U.S. citizens with literal poison gas, like yeah. chemical weapons. 
and the movie never like goes into any repercussions or they like issues with that. They describe the really. gas though. They do say they'll wake up later feeling like they're hungover. Oh, and I that, missed. That's I thought that did. guy was dead. <laughs> no, yeah, that's. <laughs> if you miss that one subtle line, because yeah. it's uh, I think it's that same general that the French dude was talking to. Yeah. He says, uh, I mean, all the farmers, the cattle ranchers, already pissed at us for gassing their their stock yeah and then uh the other dude says well i mean you know we could just use this gas in the mountain it's the same stuff we use on them they'll just wake up a couple hours with a bad hangover i did miss that because i was like the movie never touches on the ethical issues of this but but it is i mean it's still unethical it's still unethical but it's not like they're just killing people yeah it's one step above it you know it's still pretty shitty yeah and i also love how there's that sequence where it's it's uh, it's Roy, Jillian, and then this random guy who had also been there. Yeah. So they have to get Terry. to the other side of the Devil's Tower. And they're like, it's an hour hike up the mountain. And then, so they do that. The other guy, I thought, was killed, but yeah. he gets knocked <laughs> out by the gas. Roy and Jillian make it. And then they just slide down the other side. That's yeah. what they say. And they start to do that. Like, they crest the hill just as the plane's about to come get them again and then the next scene is just a cut to the bottom of the hill they like slide there and you're like did they slide down that whole mountain i was like that I'm is pretty, pretty sure they did yeah yeah, yeah that's, that's that what is kind of goofy though um but it's one of those things obviously they were yeah. fighting i mean it wouldn't add there. anything to the yeah. uh to the movie either to watch them for 15 more minutes trudge down the mountain or anything like that yeah but it's just kind of funny if you were to rank the four movies we've talked about here these alien movies mm-hmm. best to worst what would your order be Hmm, that's tough. That is. I had already tough. thought about it, so I'll go first while you think. I mean, it's not, I don't gotta think that hard. Okay. Well, I'll. Still I'll say first. that I think Arrival's the best. I think Signs is the best. Mm, interesting. And then I'd go Arrival. Yeah. And then Contact than this. I would go Arrival, Contact, Signs than this. Mm. So pretty different on there. But at least we both think this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Spielberg! Yeah. You'll never do anything. <laughs> You're a nobody. What did you like better, this or Catch Me If You Can? Uh, catch me if you can yeah. honestly i've seen this one before and yeah. i like it and i think the first time i saw it i was like re- much younger yeah so it was like pretty magical um that end there of the is sequence. definitely a wonder to that end yeah of the yeah and Did i think the alien ufo is supposed to look like a human breast wow i didn't know that and the part that comes down and the people walk out of it is supposed to be the nipple that's uh there's a lot of glowing <laughs> lights on those boobs <laughs> yeah there are <laughs> um <laughs> high five so yeah uh i think catch me if you can's better yeah um I- I think it's just a more enjoyable film. Yeah, yeah. There, it, he's a better filmmaker at that point. Yeah, that's um, true. And even then, like a lot of Spielberg, I like a lot more than this. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like if, obviously, I'm going to say this, but if the option is to watch Jurassic Park or either of the two we just named, I'd probably pl- pick Jurassic Park myself. I probably um, well, I'd, mm, for me, Catch Me If You Can is. And I get that same level, yeah, but yeah, yeah. but uh, it was in your mood, and I don't yeah. think there's any fault with that. Is no. the other thing. That's the nice thing about Spielberg. Oh, yeah. If someone's like. I don't care what you watch as long as you watch a Spielberg movie. There's still like nine nominees yeah. that are like somebody, on level. Somebody throws in uh, Munich and you're like, damn it. Yeah. I, I like yeah, Munich well It's long. The sex scene is ridiculous. I love but. the sex scene. Yeah. <laughs> so realistic. <laughs> God. No, I'd watch, uh, what was that one about a car and a train fighting? Duel. <laughs> duel. Let's watch Duel next Hell time. Hell yeah. This All is right. a Duel podcast. <laughs> the Duel cast. I actually really Book like it. that. Book it. Um, do you have any more thoughts on this? I have no. one more. Uh, oh, go on. Uh, it was something I thought of earlier, and I'll just mention it because why not? Why not? Um, it's I kind of get now why they were so secretive about the filming of this, other than just generally wanting to be secretive. But with if Star Wars had come out already when this was being filmed, then sci-fi would have been like big in people's minds. If somebody found out about this idea, they definitely would have wanted cash in. So I can get why oh, yeah. they yeah. were definitely yeah. playing yeah. it close For to sure. the chest with another sci-fi movie. Yeah, But... Annie think, Hall won Best Picture that year. I was looking. Mm. Annie Hall, Star Wars: A New Hope, and I think three movies I hadn't heard of were mm. the nominees. Okay, this yeah. this one was not. I would say. Uh, and Richard Dreyfuss won an Oscar, but not for this. Okay. Yeah, yeah I forget what movie, yeah. but just kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, it, all of that has stayed present <laughs> in our current film like yeah. culture. So yeah, for sure. Um, that about wraps it up for me. Me too. Max, where can the good people find us? Uh, you can find us making mashed potato statues while our families cry, staring at us. There's a um, fly in my mashed potatoes. <laughs> unscripted. Uh, <laughs> or you can find us at thecriticalbreakdown.com. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Hit us up on there. Yep. You can find me helping uh, J- J- Jillian, helping Jillian find her, her lost kid. Yep. 
Or you can find me at uh, Max Rivera Film on Twitter. You can find me in fireplaces abducting <laughs> Jillian's lost kid. Or you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Breakdown underscore Scott. I'm going to just go back. I'm still not on Twitter. Yeah. I know the password now, but I still haven't tweeted. So yeah. He might vote. Find me. I, I do vote. vote. I do okay. vote. Okay. <laughs> but where you definitely will find me is on Letterboxd. Letterboxd. Stenin 2. S Tenon 2. I wrote my full thoughts on A Star is Born there already. Go there, read them. Max doesn't have to be spoiled. It's true. Bada bing. Bada bing. Our music is done by uh, uh, Jason Brown. And this actually reminds me. Remember, they have the, um, at the end during that alien sequence, they have that Disney song. Oh, yeah. We didn't mention yeah, that. Yeah, we didn't mention that. It was um, Pinocchio, When You Wish Upon, when a, you star. Wish upon yeah. a Star. Yeah, they just play like the yeah. theme and it's very noticeable. It is, it is. Yeah. And it's on purpose. Yeah. So, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, Jason Brown did our music. Yeah, our artwork was done by Josh Rivera. Yeah, and uh, Walter is the podcast alien and the podcast Barry. True, what a podcast. Barry. Next week on the Critical Breakdown, it's time to go deep and investigate. We're watching Spotlight, rated 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Scandalous.